Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. Let's see how many people can make it today. I heard from some people, especially in the southern parts of the US, that they are struggling to get the power up and running again. Very fast we come like today. Just a reminder to add yourself to the meeting notes. And lastly, you're fine presenting today on Gimlet and OneShot. Uh, yes. By the way, you're a bit hard to hear. I don't know whether you're using the right mic right now. Uh, could be, I'm not. Uh, let me just yeah, check. Like... Hmm. Should be fine. But uh... I'm hearing you fine. OK, then. Ah, if I turn up my volume, then everything is fine. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no problem. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was because I was messing around with my equipment here. I'm OK. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for man. OK, so yeah. Um, yeah, let's then maybe I'm posting the link in here again. And I think most I heard from some people that they're going to watch their recording as for the I mean, you know that uh, document already, Thomas and Omar. So I propose to, from the agenda perspective, to start with a small SIG update. Uh, sorry, so a small working group update, which uh, will, I think will be short. We won't have uh, the GitOps working group today. Uh, Lily again had uh, some uh, collisions today, joined a meeting. Uh, she told us she's going to watch afterwards. And then I'll give a small update on Potato Head because we also had some additional contributions there. And then we would jump into um, the talk about Gimlet and uh, Art One. So that would be my proposal for today. Okay, we have some people joining in here. So feel obviously free to talk about other topics. I'll just drop this in the agenda. Oh, Alice, you can't hear you. You can't hear yes. me? Yeah, no, no, I can. Okay. Okay, I'd, I'd, I'd say let's kick it off with the uh, operator working group. I assume it's going to be a quick update from your side because you're in between. A lot of work, but I'll pass it over to uh, either Thomas or Omar to give us an update. Um, yes, um, currently there's not much, uh, nothing, nothing really new in the operator working group. Currently, we are trying, to, we are making progress. We are um, writing some some sections, chapters, and so on, getting feedback. Um, yes, and yes, we we. Hope to get it done soon. Um, yes, and if someone likes would like to contribute in uh, one other, or another way, um, feel free to join the, the operator working group Slack channel, or also take a look on the GitHub issues and um, just contact contact us if you want to contribute. So, so how successful was the last call for contributions? I followed some of it on Slack and Twitter, and it almost felt that people said. I don't want to contribute to like that amount of work that you were already doing, but I have this other tool which I'd like you to mention as well. So, like, like, like overall, how well did, did this go? And um, I think it's are there specific areas where you're looking for feedback? I think it, that's usually 
the other confusion confusion that I, I noticed from people say, okay, yeah, contributing, what, what exactly do you want me to do? It would be, uh, especially it would be cool if someone could provide best practices and so on for operators, because I think the whole world talks about best practices of operators, but, no, but nobody writes about it. And uh, exactly in this, in this um, area, it would be cool. And also, if someone would like to add some, some products, frameworks for operators, it would also be cool if they would be mentioned, especially for uh, what are they meant for and how they can help customers. We also changed the way we work. We uh, talked about it in the last SIG meeting. And we feel that the structure that uh, GitHub issues give us right now is better. So if someone wanted to contribute in the past and felt that he doesn't know how to do it because the Google Doc uh, structure. Right. Oh, almost. Yeah, I think almost breaking up. It's it's just bre it's breaking up for you as well, not just for me. No, it's also it was uh, it also broke up for me. Oh, okay. So, so do do you know? I mean, you're working with Omar. So, what what did you change from a structure perspective? Um, we did not strain, uh, change something since the last team meeting, uh, but there are a lot of issues regarding uh, of tasks we we. Uh, we need contributors for. Um, and what I also want to mention is we got some new contributions for, for, uh, from some frameworks as Cube Builder or I think COP. Um, and they were also very, very helpful at the moment. Yeah. Omar, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> My internet got, I, I continue to talk and then I realized that everything is stuck. So. I just wanted to say that if someone wanted to contribute in the past and the Google Doc was a hard place to do that, we now, we feel that the new GitHub issues way is better and we think it's much easier to contribute. We find ourselves easier. So if someone thought about it in the past, please come forward and think about it in the present also. Yeah, I think the more concrete you make the request for input, I think the easier it is to 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 get it. Uh, I mean, just jumping ahead a bit of the the contributions we had on the on on the Potato Head project, I just put in an issue there that, that literally read update the Flux example to Flux two. And actually, somebody really jumped in here, um, and and, and did it. So I think that they're being like very specific on on what you want. So Alison uh, jumped in, she updated the example. I think that being more specific, the more it helps. And like I was just going to write it for customize or do it for this and that. So that's kind of my learning there. It's the more specific you are, the more people are likely taking it on. So, yeah, and I think that's what, what that's why I was asking where do you exactly do you need help? Because I think that's where you're most likely. Uh, where, where, so, where then, if we just ask we have, for it's a very wide our audience, like very wide range of things people could actually do. Yeah, we have issues open for every section in the doc that still need doc, uh, content in it. Uh, it might be that the issue, I'll, we'll pass another round on the issues to verify that it states exactly what the content we expect, it, we expect to be there. Uh, but we have project and we have issues, so people just can say I'm working on that issue. Um, basically, need content, and that's hard to to ask for people. <laughs> yeah, it's not just my learning. The more specific you are, what you want, the easier it is to get from people. Yeah, I'll do another review on all the issues, making sure it's uh, documented well. Yes, we could try to provide more more specific issues. So not only write some, write some sections about um, frameworks, but for the specific framework and so on. Because I think then the then the communities also feel mentioned. And so on. 
you usually they 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 they, they quickly jump in. Uh, so also from from what we did on uh, around Potato Head when I was asking for a Helm example, people from Helm jumping in for a cloud native um, application bundles. The same thing oh. happens. So the more specifically you ask, uh, the more likely it is you get people to to jump in, and they're then usually very open to help. And that's just yeah. as a general guidance because otherwise people say, yeah, I'm doing something, but. And, and maybe we also pick like some top issues where people can contribute. But I think, do you have like great examples of real world use cases and maybe even break the real world use cases, like real world use cases for installations, for automatic upgrades, for whatever you want it. And then we can share it and uh, use Twitter and other channels to, to share it. And maybe also ask the, the end user community because this is something uh, I think we, where we could engage the, the CNCF end user community because obviously that's, uh, yeah. And a lot of people in the end user community who could do this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next topic before we jump to um, Gimlet and uh, a one chart. Uh, potato head update. So the potato head project, that's a small, tiny project uh, that we started for initially the last uh, KubeCon session, uh, which we were doing. Again, uh, newer contributions, it now supports Prometheus. We know the Prometheus support in there. They goes also to have open telemetry support in there. And we now have Flux2 support as well. So we see that people are continuously contributing to, to the project. Um, right now, I think the biggest challenge is uh, that as this was never planned to be a project, um, it's really about finding people who also test and validate examples. So the last time we had this discussion, what, uh, what kind of support would be needed? Like if somebody adds a new example, just trying out different examples with different tools is definitely helpful. I usually trust people who build tools that their examples are going to work. But for me, it's like, okay, I'm taking the example right now and I'm playing around with it. And uh, when it starts to get easier and it motivates me even more that all the examples keep run, being running on like a local uh, Kubernetes environment, it still is a challenge. It's almost this meta challenge in app delivery. How do you test your app delivery? Because you cannot automatically test uh, whether something really works. Maybe I come up with an idea on, on how to solve this problem. Um, and the other outstanding topic there, uh, where I again are not planning to make progress, is to split it up into multiple services. I think that's where the fun really starts and uh, where we can add more, uh, more, more, more in there as well. I just I think I just need to put it into an issue and uh, get, get 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 the first version done. The good thing is that now everything builds automatically anyway, so all the images are created automatically. That makes a lot of the updating uh, simpler. And again, for the actual uh, web service that we will eventually need, um, that would be somebody. I still would. I'm still looking for somebody who has more web development know-how uh, than I do, which means pretty much everybody on this planet except me, uh, where we can then dynamically assemble the, the potato head and just getting it done. I think the assembling and the other services can be done by uh, somebody who has not that much UI knowledge, but potato head itself uh, might be there. Um, yeah. and. Actually, also, as soon as we have a more stable maintainer structure, so if we find people who really have interest in getting this demo application or developing this demo application further, the idea is then also to potentially just submit it as a CNCF sandbox project, so to just make it sandbox. It has a, quite a number of contribu um, contributors, but from the maintainer perspective, uh, I think that's where it would be great to have uh, eventually other people stepping up or finding enough interest there. It's not yet submitted, but I think it would be a good candidate for um, this type of like a sandbox project. Yes, and with this, I'd actually like to pass over and because this is actually the perfect transition to Lasta because that's how we got to know each other because he contributed actually to Potato Head and put a gimlet and uh, example in there. And that's actually great what he's doing. So please uh, join us here and um, yeah, present uh, what you're doing there because I think it's like super interesting for people. I think you split it into two parts, like the gimlet part and uh, with the one, um, one chart chart. 
<laughs> yes, yeah. sure. Uh, th thanks for the invite, really. So uh, yeah, I, I just found the pot the potato head app, and uh, I used it in one of my blog posts, and then I made a contribution, and I think that's that's how we met. And uh, I don't know how much time I have. I try to keep it short, and uh, maybe I start with one chart because it's a simpler concept, and then just uh, get into the basics of what Gimlet is. Um, yeah, I think if you'd keep it to like 20 minutes, including discussions, that, that Abs should- Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to finish in 10, hopefully, and then we just we can talk. All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I hope you will see it. And uh, yeah, so I'm Laszlo Fogash. I am running my solo consulting firm, Cloud Native Stuff. Um, and uh, in besides that, I'm also putting a lot of time and effort into product development. So right now it's a consulting firm with some product uh, work. I like to flip that around if, if everything works out as, I, as I'd like it to. So uh, there is this thing called one chart, uh, which is a Helm chart. Uh, basically um, the title says it all or tries to, to sell it like a one chart to rule them all. Basically it's a Helm chart for your application deployment because you can find a chart for all the infrastructure components uh, out there, but when you start developing your own um, projects, uh, you know uh, it's it's not easy to just copy and paste your YAML snippets together. So over time, I uh, I, I started this chart, and whenever I, I came across a new, come across a new use case, like I need to set. Uh, an image, that's a basic use case, or but when I need, need to set an ingress, I just extend this chart and uh, hopefully with like 20 or 30 use cases, I can cover the typical application deployment needs. Um, just, uh, just a quick intro. So uh, by default, it, it, uh, if, if you use one chart, one chart, and you set the image and the version, it spits out, you know, a deployment and the service. So it's it's almost like the, the Helm starter chart. And later on, if you uh, add more stuff in it, like environment variables, it's one step more convenient uh, way to write this, um, this, this values file than writing the Kubernetes uh, manifest. So if you run this example, then you will get what you would expect. Uh, you have a values file. Uh, you have uh, uh, um, a config map created out of this uh, values file um, right here, the values I just provided. And this uh, config map is referenced and everything from in it is pulled in. And you know, if you want to specify an ingress, here is a, a quick way to do that. Um, I'm always in trouble finding the identation for the for the ingress uh, snippet, so I'm like making like five mistakes before I get it right. So I just put this into this uh, this chart. Uh, basic things like uh, or not, not basic things, but uh, for high availability, if replicas is greater than two, I just by default put there there are pod distribution budgets and some anti affinity rules. So it's basically if you get started, uh, you have an image. You want to deploy it quickly. Uh, that's a very convenient way to do that. And uh, I, I found myself being very happy when uh, when I'm at this stage and I want to deploy something. Uh, it it uh, sp sp speeded up my workflow quite a few times. Also, there is there is like a cron job version of it. Like uh, if you want to just uh, run a cron job, uh, finding that YAML on the Kubernetes docs page and uh, Assembling that snippet is yeah more time than I would I would like to use uh, for it, and uh, as 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 things progress, I will just add more use cases here, and it's uh, on GitHub, so you can uh, also uh, add feature requests or pull requests. So this is a very simple idea. Um, maybe you have questions to it already. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I can uh, proceed on how I, I use this little component uh, in further in my work. I actually have a, have a question because okay. what really piqued my interest is because I started to see a, a lot of people doing this right now. Like they don't keep writing all of their Helm charts. They invest a lot in templating. Actually, a, a company who, uh, who I'm working closely with they said, well, also they don't want to teach everybody how to do Kubernetes. So their, their chart contain, they also have like a reference template charts and people just put, put in the container. 
and they kept extending it. They kept on adding like service mesh configurations. They kept adding OPA rules and building more and more and more. So eventually they know when somebody deploys something, um, they know exactly what they're getting. So I think the first question is, um, how, how extensible or how, how modular is this so that I could add like my OPA configuration, my networking configuration in there. And it, it maybe it starts with the first question because then the second one would be, okay, how much can I also create my templates? Because I was just saying that you have like an API template, a web server template, a database template. So does this work? So it would be my two questions uh, here. Okay. Uh, well, so that's the other side of the story. I, so I had this template uh, in every project I had. And whenever they have a new need, whether they want to mount an Azure uh, storage bucket, or they want to just uh, uh, exclude a service from, from Linkerd service mesh, I just have these simple flags uh, given to developers. So instead of passing wiki items around and uh, YAML snippets, I just tell them that, hey, in the latest version, there is this support, so you can use that. Um, so yes, uh, I think this chart could be used as maybe a starting point for an internal chart. So obviously uh, this chart will not cover all the use cases of everybody uh, because then it will be an unmaintainable spaghetti like Helm charts uh, get often this uh, criticism. So I think I will just stop adding let's say uh, after, when I reach 30 use cases and that should cover like a basic uh, uh, OPA rules, what's that uh, open policy agent and, and so on. So, so I'd like to cover uh, the basics. And from then on, I think I have two recommendations for people. One is to, to um, fork it, which I have a private fork of this one in, uh, in a project I started recently. And the second one, if, uh, if Helm becomes too annoying for you, you can always run Helm template on your latest uh, chart and you can just have the, the YAML and you can take it wherever you like it to your own templating solution. I, I had an internal chart in, in my previous work. I think I was also have some talk about it. It's, um, I think the project is amazing, especially the website. Uh, it's, examples are, are clear and and I think that even if I don't use the chart I definitely want to use the website <laughs> okay uh, but yeah it's a, it's a great starting point to tell people uh, best use cases around things around charts around how to do it uh, and I think yeah it's it's great. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I, I, I've put a lot of effort in the and the website, and it's really targeting like people who are new to Kubernetes and 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 just want to get started. And it's sometimes the explanations aren't very naive, but I try to keep it coherent at least. Yeah, I think it's a good starting point for people to think about how they want to structure their internal charts and. Just like the potato head uh, can give a good examples to have to do things, which is missing in, in the Helm chart. Yeah, if, if I may add uh, one comment on this, I, I think this is a really good project. It's a good way to get started. Um, one of the charts that at Red Hat we've been working on is to also have an option for you to provide a Git URL and also build an image on the cluster and then deploy it. Um, I think this is probably like philosophically, this is probably the same thing what you're doing plus um, the whole build image step. Um, and since you're both working on it, I'm probably going to do some self criticism on it because I would criticize the same thing that we are doing also on it, which is while it's a great thing that you provide these knobs, um, I think the challenge which I always face and may also face and which, which I'd like to share with is that sometimes we try to override the different uh, workload spec items on top of a hem chart. And it becomes a challenge about where to stop that. Like for example, like replicas, um, it's there inside the deployment spec, but it's also there in my hem chart values YAML. I think the challenge is to figure out what is that good subset that we need to expose and what not to. And I went through the docs. I think you've done a pretty good job with it. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be a balancing exercise. And I think even at one company, like a, a, a common shared chart will be good for 95% of all the teams, but there will be always a unique team who just want to do their own thing. And that's fine. They should just then uh, maintain their fork, I guess. Right, right. I agree. All right, so, so, so this is actually a building block uh, where people who are new to Kubernetes or just want to move fast uh, can, can use. And I, I built uh, some other tooling, uh, which is uh, building on this, uh, building on Helm charts in general, but I try to promote this, this one chart approach, uh, which is Gimlet, which is like a command line tool at the moment. And uh, it is, uh, it's basically GitOps tooling and tooling around Kubernetes to get started. So if you guys are, are fine with it, I'm just gonna get into that and share the screen again. Yeah, I'm also curious about the name, why you picked the name Gimlet, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it has a good ring to it. It's a bit arcane. Uh, I know it's the drink. It's yeah. not about the drink. Uh, so I, um, Gimlet is also like a little carpentry tool, like a little drill, like a hand drill and that's what I found like a great analogy. Like I'm building a tool and that's a nice little handy tool. So that's sort of uh, the analogy I would like to, to get across, but I think everybody thinks about the drink and I just uh, accepted it by now. And I, I like it for the, the, the ring to it, like Gimlet. I, I just like how it sounds. All right then, I, I just get into Gimlet just very shortly because uh, um, I think it's larger um, thing or it eventually it will be larger than just a, a 10 minute demo, but I, I just get started. So, uh, so Helm charts. So I, I, I got a little bit, bit uh, uh, overboard with, uh, with Helm charts and Helm charts has a values uh, JSON schema file. And, uh, and based on that, I made a little uh, tool uh, inside the Gimlet CLI uh, let me just navigate there, which is called uh, Chart Configure. Um, you may have seen this already, but uh, so if I type Gimlet Chart uh, Configure One Chart One Chart, it actually opens a UI, <laughs> and uh, I, I generate this UI uh, based on the uh, values uh, schema file, values JSON schema. So if people are, again, new to Kubernetes, they can just come here uh, and have a UI on their laptops, uh, set some uh, readiness probes, change the path to health Z. Um, maybe if they are savvy enough, they can uh, delay the, the, the health checks. And basically, uh, if they close the browser, uh, then they should have uh, the values file uh, printed on their screen. So that's that's basically the values file for one chart. And if I just go one step further, uh, if I uh, pipe this into Helm template, one chart, one chart, and then uh, give it as a standard input. Again, if I just do some changes, uh, this time it's going to be um, my bore, my value. And again, if I close this screen, then you know the values file was piped into uh, the the one chart, and the config map has this value, so my var, uh, my value. So it's sort of there is like a little workflow if people want to uh, just work with the Helm values files, they can uh, they can use this. I think it's even able to get. Uh, a saved values file. So if I would have saved this values file, I could have feed in, in, into this workflow again. And uh, I can generate manifests like this. And uh, with Gimlet, I am a huge fan of GitOps. I think everybody is these days. Uh, but if you have uh, a Helm template, I also wrote another little tool, uh, which uh, is Gimlet GitOps uh, write um, and then it, it basically uh, writes into a local copy of a GitOps repository uh, following some um, conventions. So if you, if I, 
maybe I, I, I will just run this example shortly. Just uh, let me just look in, into this uh, GitOps repo I have here with uh, the folder structure. So how about uh, the environments should be maybe production, uh, the app, oh, app should be my app and uh, GitOps repo path should be GitOps. And I'm crossing fingers that I know my bash enough. Uh huh. I, I don't. <laughs> Some something got misinterpreted here. So so let me just uh, break this up, okay? So let me just write uh, the manifest to to, to manifest.yaml. Um, so this configuration with replicas ten. Oh, close. Oh, maybe I have some state issues here. One more time. 10, close it. Good. So now I have the manifest file with replicas four. And if I uh, gimlet gitops write uh, the manifest file uh, to production app my app and gitops repo path is gitops then i think it has written it to the gitops uh, um, folder structure that uh, gimlet likes or, or promotes there is like a little convention how to structure this so that's basically Gim gimlet gitops right it's a little handy tool that you can use from ci so that's sort of the, the workflow idea behind it that some people likes to write their GitOps repo by hand, not uh, having, for example, Flux auto update the image. So in this case, you know, code change comes in, there is a CI testing process, artifacts, so on, and then you write stuff to the GitOps repo from where the GitOps controller is pulling down stuff. So this uh, little CLI, Gimlet CLI, is uh, able to give you a set of conventions um, and a few tools like writing uh, manifests to this uh, structure, deleting, and also bootstrapping the, uh, the GitOps uh, cycle. Also, it, it has like a, a gimlet seal command to, because um, one chart has support for sealed secrets and you know, a sealing sealed secrets is kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> Sorry, just a pain. Uh, meaning that you have to like uh, sealing keys one by one and so on. So there is a little convenience feature. And just the last thing I'd like to add that um, all this uh, playing with values files is nice. Uh, with Gimlet, I also introduced uh, a, a manifest file structure which is very similar to all the Helm release CRDs you have seen that are out there, Flux, Argo CD, everywhere. I also have my own, <laughs> which is uh, uh, the only difference is that uh, you, you should keep this in with your application source code. So this is for developers. It is, this is like a split workflow. So developers will be able to store their whole configuration in their source code repo this is the values file, file part. This is the chart reference, and this is some additional uh, meta information. And uh, Gimlet has some uh, tools to process these files, render the manifests, write them, them into the right place. So that's where Gimlet is today. That's a CLI and mostly helping people who do stuff from their CI or from their laptop just to play around with GitOps. Uh, and right now I'm uh, extending it uh, with a server side component, which is basically um, detaching everything from CI. So it's not CI from where you write stuff anymore to the GitOps repository. Instead, uh, I introduce a server side component, which we are able to support uh, like policy based deploys, like everything from master should go to production or some on demand stuff, rollbacks and so on without uh, replaying the, the CI procedure and perhaps introducing more uh, access control as well. So that's just the future stuff. Uh, I just uh, um, 
put the concept down there in the blog post. So that was that. It was quite a lot of things, I think. Uh, I think for now, what I wanted to, to convey is that one chart is, is a very nice uh, foundational building block or charts in that sense, which I, I, I build more stuff on top, how to generate uh, uh, manifests out of it, how to store them if, effectively. And, and I also try to give people more workflows. So that is going to be Gimlet. So uh, that's that. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that's pretty cool. So when I first saw it, I thought, okay, this is like really nice, especially like the UI and the, the configuration capabilities. I think there is a bigger discussion on where your environment configuration should live. And as you mentioned, different tools have different opinions about where this should be. Um, I think what was confusing me a bit because you called it a GitOps tool. So I was assuming that there is a, a component that actually does the Deployment, like you would have, like in in Flux or say in a in, in an Argo CD type of uh, environment. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there's already a lot of components out there that can do exactly this, and uh, why invest in something that, that 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 already exists? I think that's just maybe a a, a comment here. So when you told me it's a, it's a GitHub tool, I was expecting something different than than what it actually is. Um, so. I don't know how, how the other people think about it, but it was just, I think that, that the naming might be, uh, might be a bit, bit misleading here. But what the tool is doing, I think is great. Like helping to manage the, the, those components and so forth. I think it's it's super helpful and, and useful. And I think as other, we had other people here as well, that they can see the value. So I'd like to get other people's touch on, it's who used to work a lot on uh, Kubernetes, uh, deployment and also have to make them available for other people. I know that Thomas does because we're already working closely together. So I'll make it up to other people now for questions. If anybody wants to. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I just, just a quick reaction. I think it's a fair, fair, fair point. Uh, I should, really find uh, what I, am I really building? Is it a release manager? Is it some other thing? Maybe you guys have some ideas. <laughs> How should I name it? Uh, but true, I don't have the actual GitOps control loop that synchronizes stuff between Git and the cluster. I use Flux for that because it just does a great job. Yeah, I, I don't know how you would describe it if you really don't want to use the word GitOps, but if you, I, I, I can't imagine other than a GitOps repo editor, which is really what you're doing, uh, which is the left-hand side of a, a, a full GitOps CI CD workflow. So, um, you know, I, I, I always find it tricky when people say it's not GitOps unless there's a deploy step. Okay, well, that's probably true. If it, you don't deploy something, you're not really doing GitOps, you're just editing static files somewhere. So I think the the interesting question to me is when you see this kind of stuff, what is the actual workflow for um, validating the changes before they actually get deployed? Now you're slamming into your Git repo, you better be able to undo your changes and do all sorts of other things because right now it's all, the tool looks like it's just helping you edit quickly. So if I had infinite speed fingers, I could do that man manually and I'd still have problems when I push to my repo with continuous deployment because I didn't validate anything. So the whole, I, I'm interested in these tools because they help you do things and not make errors, but then you still have to, uh, you still have to do them, I would say, in flight actively. So you have to see what happens when they fail deploy. Will these tools be used to undo your things, undo your good deeds in your repos? Those kinds of things are, are interesting to me because unless you actually have the edit part, the validation part, and then the application which could fail, and then un, you know you have to roll back and do all sorts of other stuff. You're you're solving one one piece of the problem, I guess. Would be my comments. I really like what you said about the editor part because at this point the CLI is really just doing that. So uh, well, I, I think it's a. Uh, so when, once once you do that, you then start to grow. If you were growing this kind of capability, you would say edit, then you need a validate step, which is the shift left of the 
the linter that you would run on your manifest before you let Flux or Argo CD take it and deploy it. Because if you make a, you know, if you make an edit, if you're doing this by hand and you make a typo, your replica is to 4 million, right? When they arrive at your cluster, perfectly good integer, arrive at your cluster, they won't, uh, there's not enough resources to do that many. So it'll just sit there in pending state. Those kinds of things should be caught long before you actually push to the repo. So if you have tools to edit, you should also have tools that validate, um, which is part of your CI for, for Git repos, for GitOps repos, and then, um, and then potentially even dynamic validation. So uh, if you know where it's going, then you'd have to talk to your deployment facility to, to pull the rules like admissions controller rules or policy rules that you may or may not be violating. So, it's, so you're at the beginning of a, of a pretty big piece of work where you can, you know, you, you just don't want, uh, you want edit, the edit capabilities to ensure that the structure doesn't, you know, you don't, you don't uh, mess up your structure because you're not going to do it manually. You just don't let someone go in and hammer the YAML. You, if you go through tools, that's how you can sort of simplify that. And, and then you could even have logging capabilities. So you could keep track of who did it and what did it. Like, you know, you could grow this to be infinitely capable. So I don't know where you want to take it, but that's sort of, it's an interesting, uh, um, you know, a lot of these, and, and yes, who, who, I don't know who said it earlier. Uh, some of the, there's a lot of these tools as well. So people write, they start, they get excited, they write a bunch of tools that help them. And then the question is, how do you build an ecosystem around a tool that does the one thing really well, plus the other tools that do their one things really well, and then flow into the, the universe of uh, sort of GitOps, which just has lots of pieces. So. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Yeah, I think calling it an editor might be good uh, as well. I also like the validation part because that very often obviously hits you. Like at least having the ability to do a dry run on and, and things, and there's like other nice things that I, I I'd see that I were um, where we usually struggling is okay. I want to have this for another environment. Like I want to clone an environment, just build it, but I want to modify just a couple of things like on a base repo. And maybe it's something else. It, depending on how how close you want to get to Git, when you at least commit something to Git. Uh, almost like having, I mean, I mean, Git per se is version management. It, it, however, it's, it is version management uh, in, a, in a way that necessarily doesn't help me if there's a lots of pushes to a Git repo before I deploy. You'd like go back from version one to, to version two. It's, it's built for source code. And if you look at all of the, the uh, the, the, the providers out there, you have like, they're called merge requests or pull requests and then you have like bigger change sets. I think if, if you have something like a change set management, that would will also be all cool because that's what you often have to do. You know, want to like upgrade, 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 upgrade. And they can want to like get like more or less my, my configuration drift between two environments deployed. One scenario that we see, and again, this is my problem, not necessarily yours. That people keep continuously deploying to say their dev environment and obviously the, the data can't take latest as a whole and want to deploy it to stage but they want just to take okay give me one change set and for them it's actually really just one change set not, not multiples hope it makes sense somehow so you're, so you're saying your dev environment has, has a cumulative set of pushes so hundreds of yeah. potential changes but you only want a subset of the the three you really like and they're not managed as a separate branch or a separate set is that correct yeah at some point so we, we keep we see a lot of people that keep death open um, more or less so that people can push and push in there and it's especially if it's a bigger repo you might say well i'm taking like the updates on this service and i'm not taking the updates on the other service obviously this depends on how you structure your git repo I think the way you structure it, like directory, uh, directory, uh, directory stage, and the directories below are the services. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I understand what you're doing. I'm not sure that's. Uh, I think that's an abuse of of Git in some way. Um, you know, if you want a developer to to, are, are are these dev environments shared then, so they're constantly integrated? Yes, they are constantly integrated. Yeah. So you have no hope but to share through that push, common push. And if right, okay, that that that's 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 your problem because the normal way you would do this if you had the resources is you'd fork your GitOps repo, you'd point it at your own environment, you'd push as many dev configurations as you like, and then you submit a pull request with the final one up to your to your 
um, to your dev environment that's the shared one as opposed to your personal one. But if you're forced to share a CI integration environment and everyone's slapping their changes on, but you just want to cherry pick some, um, you'd have to check them all out into a branch and then send a pull request from that branch into your stage environment where you're just integrating those three. And I suspect cherry picking those is kind of be tricky if you have hundreds. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be done, but it's, you just see people that sit in, if they go to the, like really this extreme approach and they can't replicate environments for each individual developer, also for risk cost constraints. And they also kind of want to get them to a point where they say, well, you should use this, should not, your deployment should not break other people's deployments. Yeah, but yeah, I, I agree. It's, I think it's a matter of taste. I think what we're all trying to say here, I think it's a great tool and there's lots, lots of other problems out there. Um, yeah, I think it's also good for, um, I think it's part of the work eventually for the GitOps uh, working group. And I really wanted to get this here because I think it, I think it can help a lot of people do a lot of things. Well, for me, the number one thing it does, it helps people to easier get started with Kubernetes and getting something deployed. Like this whole idea, which we have of making things simpler, I think one chart can be of, of a great help and also Gimlet can be of a great help. Like you have now a repo and then you take now a tool and let it go in there. And I also like the one thing that's, you have the small tools that do one thing well. Like I remember this from this whole, um, from the whole web community. It's. I think our industry is always evolving around. We build a lot of small tools that we can plug together. Then we decide, no, that's not a good idea. Then we build one big tool end to end that does it all. Then we realize, no, that's not a big idea either. And then we go back and forth. Uh, right, right now, I'm more in favor of let's, let's build a, a couple of smaller tools and let people pick and choose what, what they want because we're all in this early learning phase. Uh, and things are revolving quickly. So that's what I would like. It's like, like I'm not buying into everything. I can use one chart, but I can use like totally different tooling for other things. So that's, I think, really cool. With most projects that come out of real world problems. Okay, we have more or less used up the time uh, today. Uh, Ed already left, but I think we have people still here from also from. Uh, from Argo, so if you, if you haven't interacted with the Argo people yet, I would encourage you to so reach out to them. I mean, it should work with Argo pretty much out of the box. And it would even be a way to do it easier because you have a predefined Git, stra, uh, Git repo structure, uh, which I think is great. And yeah, I think we'll do use the mailing list and to talk about topics to present for the next upcoming meeting to talk more about that. It was a good presentation, thank you. Unless anybody has any questions left. I'm not kicking people out here. All right. Then. Thank you, thank you guys uh, for the opportunity and also for the great feedback. I, uh, I had a few thoughts. Thank you for presenting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.